night before the landing, I can remember very well, uh, the crew of the transport that I was on uh, couldn't ask for a better crew. They were very kind to us, uh, always saw that we were well taken care of. And uh, we were invited down to the mess hall on the night before the landing, uh, which was a surprise, to have coffee and donuts. And uh, while we're having our coffee and donuts, uh, the ship's radio was picking up Tokyo Rose's broadcasts. I don't know if you've ever heard of yes. Tokyo Rose. And uh, it was coming from Tokyo, of course. And it was a propaganda uh, broadcast, of course. They'd play American music to make us happy, or thought they were making us happy. And uh, here we are just the night before the invasion, and we thought that everything was such tight security that the Japanese could not possibly know we're coming. And I'll never forget her words in between uh, two of the songs that she was playing. And she said, welcome, men of the 5th Marine Division to Iwo Jima. And I think uh, it can best be described as saying uh, a cold chill uh, uh, took over. By the way, they got us up very early. I believe the hour was around 3 o'clock. And uh, we had our final meal of, of steak and eggs. And that's rather traditional in Marine Corps. I think that described most of all, it was quiet. I think each man was lost in his own thoughts uh, about what's going to happen when we hit that beach. Uh, am I going to make it? Am I going to come out of this battle alive? And of course, first and foremost, I think everyone had on their minds the, the folks back home, the families and what have you. I think the only thoughts I had at that time was that uh, uh, I was questioning as to whether I was going to be able to do the job that was expected of me. As I looked around, as you mentioned the other men, I said to myself, gee, am I going to be able to take care of these guys when they get hit? Am I going to be up to it? Or am I going to have the courage? Uh, do I have the knowledge? But th those are just fleeting thoughts. And uh, then your mind goes on to something else. And we've been led to believe that because of the tremendous uh, pre-invasion naval bombardment and the uh, bombardment by the uh, uh, United States Air Corps, that there'd be few, if any, Japanese left on the island. And those who may be left would be so shell-shocked, so to speak, that they would not be able to resist us. And we really believed it when they said it would be a three to five day operation. Now came the time to, uh, to leave the ship, to go down to cargo net. And uh, we lined up in front of cargo net. And uh, I had just swung my right leg over the gunnel, along with the others, and uh, I believe it was the skipper's voice, the Navy skipper's voice, came over and said, halt, or words to that effect. He says, we're going to have a prayer by the chaplain. And uh, I was in that position, one foot on the deck of the ship and the other up over the gunnel, and the chaplain recited the 23rd Psalm uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that psalm or not, uh, but included in it are the words, uh, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And uh, once again, th those words uh, sent a chill up our spine. And uh, when the prayer was over, then down the cargo net and into the landing craft. Each landing craft heads to what we call rendezvous point. And as each landing craft gets to uh, rendezvous point, it becomes an uh, ever-widening circle. And as more landing craft join, the wider the circle gets. And then the word comes from the command ship to head for the beach. And what was now a, what was a circle 
now becomes a wave as it just stretches out. And now you've got wave after wave after wave. And uh, as we got closer to the beach, uh, of course, an enemy fire was coming in on us and hitting some of the landing craft. The area of the beach that we landed on was Green Beach, just right, right under Surabaji. And uh, as we left the landing craft, we advanced a few yards and then there was a, what can best be described as a terrace, okay. all right? We call it the first terrace. And after you went up this first terrace, there was a, a plateau for several yards and then there was another terrace. And I think, uh, I think I got as far as the second terrace, and at that time things were relatively calm. And uh, if my recollection is correct, it's when I was at the second terrace, or first reached the second terrace, that, that all hell broke loose. Uh, it, it's very difficult to describe, because it just came in one huge barrage. And, Every gun that they had on the island opened up against us. On D-Day itself, you see, it's this ideal. In training, everything's ideal, of course, all right? But it doesn't always, it's not always ideal on the battlefield. Uh, so in training, it'll always be two men to a foxhole, all right? But, but on the battlefield, it's not like that. On, uh, on D-Day, I ended up in a foxhole all by myself, or I thought I was by myself when I jumped into it. There was a Marine in there who had lost an arm, blood streaming out of his head. He's already dead. I didn't know that when I jumped in. I had no choice but to jump in there because it was heavy shelling and machine gun fire. And uh, it, had already, it had already become dark. And uh, I didn't want to stay there, but I could not get out of there. The fire was too intense. And I, I tried to get some shut eye uh, but you've got to remember the scene, there's flares going on all night. Enemy flares as well as our own lighting up the battlefield. And uh, whenever I awaken after my 40 winks, he would be staring at me. There was an eerie, this is an eerie situation. And so I took his poncho and covered him up so that I didn't have to, to look at him anymore. And then I tried to catch another 40 winks. But when I wake up again, this poncho seemed always to be slipping off and he would always be staring at me. And so that was my first night on the beach. It's just he and I in the foxhole. The first one I went to was beyond my help. Uh, one arm was gone and a good part of the shoulder with it and he had a very severe head wound but not dead at the time I got to him but he died within minutes and that was my first uh, case at Iwo Jima. Uh, I remember one uh, very sad episode there uh, I came across the Marine who Obviously, he'd been treated by a corpsman before I came to him. His chest had been blown open, he had head wounds also. And uh, whoever had treated him before I got there had put a huge battle dressing over his chest. And uh, he was conscious. And uh, he is speaking rather feebly to me. And uh, he asked me to go into his pack which was on his back. He was lying on his back, by the way. And very gently, I was able to roll him 
a little on the side to where I was able to open his pack. And uh, inside of his pack was a, a photograph, uh, probably an eight by 10. It was a rather large photograph of a woman with an infant in her arms. And uh, I'm assuming it was his wife and child. And the photograph, just like his uniform and his pack had been pierced by shrapnel. And uh, he wanted it. And uh, I took it from his pack and put it in his hands. And uh, he looked at it and uh, smiled very weakly. And that was it, he just passed away. I remember a, a BAR man, that's a Browning Automatic Rifleman, uh, crawled over to me and he says, Doc, uh, corpsmen are called Doc in the Marine Corps, the title of which I'm very, very proud, by the way. And he said, uh, I, I don't want to use the names here. So he says, the battalion commander's been hit. I said, oh my goodness. I said, okay. He said, I'll take you to him. And we crawled, and the fire was very, very intense. And as we're crawling along, I, I was hit in, in the leg. And, uh, but we kept crawling, and probably in all, we must have crawled some 75 yards. It seemed like it was never going to end. And, uh, he finally says to me, he says, well, well, there he is. And I look and uh, all I can see is an arm still flexed. And it's just as if you had taken a knife and cut off all this part of the shoulder. And that's all that was left of him. And uh, I found out later that uh, he had come out to check the lines to see how the lines were going because things were really hot at that time. And that an artillery shell had landed just about at his feet and just uh, blew him into smithereens, as they say. Uh, so there was nothing I could do for him. And I had known him quite well. And uh, that, that, that was one of the casualties that I that really affected me because I had known him and he was a very fine leader, very well respected. And, uh, but there was just nothing I could do for him. There was nothing left. And to think that it may have been from our own gunfire didn't uh, uh, ease the pain in any way, that's for sure, for any of us. This is rather difficult for me to speak of, but on uh, uh, D plus three, uh, I got the word that uh, my best buddy, a corpsman like myself, and another corpsman, along with uh, a few Marines, uh, were killed over near the command post at the base of Surabaji. And that was very late in the day that I got the news. And uh, that really grieved me that he had been my very best friend. We spent many liberties together up in Hollywood. His girlfriend lived across the street from my girlfriend in Hollywood. Uh, he had given me a letter that before we left the transport that uh, if anything happens to him, it was a letter that I was to give to his family. Uh, unfortunately, I lost my pack at, at Iwo Jima mm -hmm. under circumstances I don't want to talk about. And so that letter was lost for all time. So I, I never got a chance to uh, give it to his family. And uh, the next day, uh, 
I was able to go to that command post and ask what happened, and uh, none of them really knew. They don't know whether it was an incoming shell or whether it was an enemy landmine that someone had stepped on in that area. But it killed not only these two corpsmen, but uh, a few other Marines and uh, wounded several also. Uh, that was probably uh, my most difficult day at Iwo Jima, emotionally wise, speaking of. I can best describe that by saying each one dies differently. Some die in, in almost uh, a convulsive state. Others, you'll be working on them and they'll just pass away and you're not even aware of it at the time. Quite often you'll hear the wounded, especially those who are very severely wounded, saying mother, mother, they're, they're, or mama, or mom that they're calling for their mother because all of their life they've always depended upon their mother for solace and, and uh, someone to take care of them. And that, that's very sad. But again, uh, you don't let it bother you. You just keep on going, do the best you can. Uh, one of the things that you're almost constantly asked uh, is, uh, are you gonna be able to get me out of here? Can we get out of here? And uh, my answer was always yes. Although in my mind, uh, in most cases, I knew that <laughs> there's no way for us to get out of here. Uh, I had an interesting experience in that uh, I was working on a Marine who, he knew he wasn't going to make it, and I certainly knew he wasn't going to make it. And his voice was only a whisper. And uh, I had to bow down real close to hear what he was saying, and he's saying, priest, priest. He wanted a priest. And with that, I checked his dog tag and saw that he was Catholic. So obviously he wanted, he knew what's going to happen to him, he wanted the last rites. And, uh, it just so happens uh, <laughs> that only a few yards from me was the Jewish chaplain, of whom I know quite well. And I, I said to him, I said, Rabbi, have you seen Father Bradley, who was our Catholic chaplain? He says, well, I saw him earlier. He says, but I don't know where he may be, at, be now. And he says, is there anything I can do to help you? I says, well, I have a, a Catholic boy here who requested the last rites. And he says, oh, I'll take care of him. And uh, he came over, and whatever it is he did or said, he gave solace to that, that dying Catholic boy. Uh, the Catholic boy that was dying had no way of knowing that it was not a priest, but it didn't matter. It doesn't matter who the solace comes from or the comfort comes from, but he was there to, to give it to him. Well, in 36 days, let's say, I'm not very good at arithmetic, you know, in 36 days, if you worked on Approximately, uh, if you work on three a day, three a day, that'd be approximately a hundred. So we have to say, oh, it would be in the hundreds that you worked on in some way, in some fashion. Any corpsman who was there would have worked on hundreds of casualties. You've got to remember, you know, that uh, no one suffered uh, more heavily at Iwo Jima than the, than the corpsman. Are you aware of the fact that over 800 corpsmen were killed or wounded at Iwo Jima? That's a fantastic figure. Those doctors and corpsmen there deserve all the credit in the world, uh, especially at Iwa, where there's just an unending procession of 
litter is being brought in with the wounded on there, they perform miracles. The best way to look at it is they perform miracles. Uh, round the clock, just kept going, 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 going. Iwo Jima had to be taken. There was a tremendous loss of life there, as you know. Over 25,000 wounded, 7,000 dead. But it had to be taken at any cost. The cost was high, but if it wasn't taken, the cost to the United States would have been even higher because all of those Air Corps men on a bombing race to Japan would never have made it back. It's my understanding some 22,000 Air Corps lives were saved because they were able to make emergency landings at Iwo Jima. So 7,000 Marines and corpsmen die so that 22,000 Air Corpsmen may live. That's a pretty good trade-off. All for freedom. I guess I was just lucky. It's the only word I can use uh, to explain it. Uh, certainly there were many, many times when I never thought or believed that I would get off that island. Uh, in fact, uh, I think I'd almost made my mind up to the fact that I would not get off the island alive. But you just go about doing what you have to do each day and then all of a sudden that day comes when they said, it's over, fellas. You're going back aboard the ship. Well, I really don't have to tell you how terribly proud I am that, uh, that I can say I'm an Iwo Jima veteran, that I was there, uh, that I did the job I was trained for, I did it to the very best of my ability. And the pride in the tradition, once a Marine, always a Marine? Absolutely. And any corpsman who serve with the Marine Corps uh, shares in that motto. Once a Marine, always a Marine, always faithful. That's it. To this day, you can't forget it. It was too big a part of a person's life to be forgotten. the high point of my life, there's no doubt about it. <laughs>